Okay, so today we're gonna we're, we're gonna get started now. So today we're gonna be doing our first lecture. This is gonna be for our first lab, which is stress and strain featuring the extensometer. Remember that lab two is gonna be really similar. And in fact, we're still going to use the extensometer, but we're gonna add on a new tool called the strain gauge. So we're gonna talk uh, about the extensometer today and we're gonna go into the theory of the stress and strain curve. Uh, which, so I, I know a lot of you, or maybe not a lot, but some of you have already taken the stress mechanics lab. But for those of you that are taking it now, which I think there should be a lot, um, I just wanna make sure that, have you guys already gone over stress and strain and the stress strain curve in your class this semester? Are you talking about the solids mechanics class? Yeah, I was, is it called solid mechanics? It, I think it changed names like two times now, but yeah, that class. Oh, okay. Well, my teacher, he kind of just introduced it to us. He didn't really like go into too much depth. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Okay. We're going to go over stuff today. So um, I guess a little ironically, maybe I'll go in more depth before you guys do, which is kind of surprising. But anyways, we're going to go over that and before our experiment next week, I'm sure you guys will go over it in a lot of depth in your class. All right, so I'm going to click on here. Remember that next week is the first lab, so we're going to be in person. We're going to meet first in the classroom, so that's E42. And, and there, I'm going to kind of talk about the lab, kind of do a little briefing in there, and then we're going to split off into groups. Remember, we have four groups, groups of about four to five people per group. And then we're going to go over to the lab. And in there, I'm going to give you guys a demo of this lab um, to show you what you have to do, you know, how to set up the, uh, the test setup, and then how to actually run the experiment. Didn't want to go there. Yeah, so yeah, we do have a uh, lab next week. So there is, I had a class yesterday, or I had a question yesterday about that as well. So even though there's Labor Day on Monday, uh, we still have lab next week. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do today is kind of, I'm going to go to VKS again and kind of show you guys, give you a little preview of what we're doing in the lab. We, we did look at VKS last week, but I'm going to, discuss the lab in a little more detail today. So remember the VKS login, that's a login that's for the entire school. And the login info for that is under the week one page. So down here. So there's um, kind of a, not really a question, a statement uh, that generally that uh, if, if there's one day off that all labs are canceled that week. And yeah, that's true for the physics labs, like 225 and 226. But for all of the labs after that, at least for the labs I've taken, 306A, 306B, 476A, and 476B, that never happened. So um, even if there's one lab that's, you know, on a holiday that week, the other labs, they still meet. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of a, a bummer as a student, <laughs> but that's how it is. Basically, if you're that lab where uh, there's a holiday on that day, you got to do double time one week, and that kind of sucks too. Okay, so for this lab, remember that it's, of course, stress and strain, and we're going to have three different metal rods. So we have aluminum and two different types of steel. And in the beginning of the lab, um, you know, so all of the rods, they look like this, where it's kind of tapered in the center. The first thing that you're going to do is not measure the length. I don't know why this picture is in here. You don't have to measure this length. Uh, also, since I just thought of it, 
Dr. Siu, she actually made some updated lab procedures which show all of these pictures. And um, basically the updated part is it shows pictures for the new software that we're gonna use. So I'll give you guys that uh, probably this weekend, I'll upload it to Canvas. Everything looks you know, very similar to what you see here on, v on VKS, but the only difference is that it shows the new software. So the first thing that you're gonna do once you're in the lab is you're gonna take your metal rod, whatever it is, and on three different locations in this tapered section, you're gonna measure the, di the diameter. And from that, you're gonna get the average diameter. We need that to, of course, uh, calculate the cross-sectional area for this area of interest on the rod. So here's our machine that we're always gonna be using. Um, five out of six times for our labs. Of course, we're gonna have different um, fixtures depending on what we're trying to do for that experiment. Okay, so this is our hand controller. So oftentimes before we run the experiment, we're gonna be using this hand controller to manipulate the, the jaws on our test machine so we can actually set up the experiment. So what you need to do is you're going to Press this little lock button, you're going to see a green light turn on. That means that you have, or that the handset has control of the machine. All right, so what you're going to do is take your rod. You're going to put it into the top jaw here. Okay, question from Osseo. We have to go over this before we go to the lab next Friday, correct? I, I probably won't go over it as in much detail as I'm doing now but I'll kind of give you guys some like reminders. And really what's important for you guys is once we go to the lab, I'm gonna actually demonstrate all of this in person. And of course you're gonna have these procedures too on hand. Okay, so uh, again, you're gonna take your specimen here and you're going to attach it uh, to the top jaw. And you need to leave about a quarter of an inch from the top. So there's a little space right here. And you're gonna tighten that down with this handle here. Uh, don't go like um, insane, you know, you're gonna make it nice and tight, nice and snug, but um, you don't need to over tighten it. All right, so once it's in this top jaw, you see it's secured, and then we're gonna use this hand controller and we're gonna press down with this, um, this down arrow here. So these arrows that you see here, um, oh yeah, by the way, so I think last week you guys couldn't see my cursor my class right after they could. So hopefully you can see it now. So yeah, anyways, okay, good. So I don't know why you couldn't see it was some weird zoom glitch. So these arrows, they are your macro controls, meaning that they're gonna, you know, it's gonna be a, a large movement uh, for this jaw. So you're gonna use the down arrow to go down, of course. And later on, when we apply a preload, we're gonna use this uh, little wheel here, this scroll wheel, and that's for very fine mi uh, micro adjustments. Okay, so you're gonna lower that top jaw down. So this uh, end of the rod goes into the lower jaw. And again, we're gonna leave about a quarter of an inch of space, and then we're gonna tighten down this bottom rod. You can see that here it's, it's not tightened down yet. You wanna make sure that this rod is nice and concentric with the hole that's in here. All right, so here's our extensometer, the the jewel, nah, not, not really the jewel, but the focus of this experiment. And let's move on. So here's the extensometer and you're basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna line it up to the specimen that we have. Make sure that these metal blades you want to make sure that they have good contact on the rod. So it's a little hard to tell from this angle, but it looks like the bottom one is pretty good. And this top one actually doesn't look that good. So hopefully they fixed that when they were doing this. But you see, it looks like it's only contacting the specimen on, on this left-hand side. You want to make sure that that's nice and centered. If it's not, it's going to affect the readings that we have. Okay, so you're then going to actually attach this extensometer to the specimen by using these clips here. They just clip right on. 
And you see here we're using the scroll wheel. So I always forget if you are scrolling down or up. You'll see uh, once we get to the to the lab, whether scrolling down is going to apply the preload or scrolling up. Uh, I always forget because it seems kind of backwards usually in my head. Anyways, you're going to apply a preload of about 10 pounds. So it's very light, but that's basically so we can get rid of any kind of slack and we can start applying some force in the direction that we want, which of course is going to be tension. Make sure you use the scroll wheel, by the way, when you're applying this preload. Sometimes, you know, students, they'll have a little brain fart and they use the arrow. Remember, the arrow is their macro adjustment, so you're going to be applying hundreds of pounds of force, like, immediately if you use the arrows. Not good, so make sure you use the scroll wheel. I'll have a reminder for that, too. So once we're ready to start the experiment, we're going to remove this safety pin here, which is going to allow the extensometer to actually move. So currently, this is uh, 2 inches, and it can't move because of the safety pin. Once we take that safety pin out, then this extensometer can deform. Remember, um, the extensometer measures deformation. It can deform at the exact same rate as our specimen. So once we take that safety pin out, we're going to go to our software and we're going to zero everything out. So we're going to zero out the load that we just applied, that preload. And we're going to zero out any readings that show up on the extensometer. It should be, uh, you know, basically zero already, though. Okay, we're going to go back to our hand controller. We're going to press that lock button again so the control for the movement of the jaws goes away from the hand controller and it goes back to the computer. Um, you probably should have already done this step before, but remember when I said that you don't need to over tighten the jaws, they should be nice and snug. To make sure it's good, you kind of give the jaws a little bit of a wiggle and make sure that it's not extremely loose. And then we're ready to go. So we're just gonna press play. You know, I don't know what it's like on that new software, it's probably a play button to you. I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to look. I'm going to go to Dr. Sue's lab actually next weekend and uh, have a look at the software. All right, so then our experiment is running now once we press play. So it's applying a load and um, it's going to keep increasing that load, which is going to increase our deformation until in the end we have a fracture here. Also, you can see that uh, this cross-sectional area has decreased right around this range here and this range here. We're going to talk about that today. Okay, and one thing you're going to do at the very end of the experiment is, okay, right here. We're going to get those two pieces that broke and we're going to kind of put them back together and we're going to measure that diameter at that fracture surface. And we're going to use our initial diameter and our final diameter here to then calculate the cross-sectional area at the beginning and at the end. And we're going to use that as a way to uh, kind of define the ductility of each material. All right. And that's the lab. So that's all. Of course, that's one test. You guys got to do the same thing two more times so you can do the test for all three materials. All right. So a little preview and kind of a little preview of what we're actually going to be talking about today. Uh, but are there any questions uh, that I can answer on the experiment? Okay. So now I'm going to stop sharing my computer screen. I'm going to share my iPad and I want to kind of make this a little bit better because, well, um, my, my video is going to go away. Um, yeah, I could use zoom, but it looks like I hate having the little, uh, little block in the recording. So it just, I don't know, kind of random, but I'm going to 
try to get a better method where I can also have a good quality for my iPad and show my webcam. But for now, I'm going to share my iPad and I'm going to go away for, for a bit. Well, my webcam is. All right. So, I'll, oh yeah, the slides. So I already kind of mentioned this, the slides that I have here, they, they're just supplemental. Um, so you can look at them yourself if you'd like and kind of follow along that way. They're on Canvas, they're on the page for today. And I don't know if I'm gonna do this for every single lecture. I, you know, I've taught this class a few times now and I've never used the slides, but if you had me in 205, you know that I did the same kind of thing where I had slides to kind of be a supplemental uh, addition for the, for the lecture. All right, so first thing that we are gonna talk about today is stress. Oh, let me pull something up on my computer. Give me one second. All right, so first thing is stress. So even if you guys haven't talked about stress and strain in like a lot of depth yet in your class, you've probably gone over the basics, which is, you know, the formulas for stress and strain and just the general idea. So for stress, um, you know, it's, it's pretty intuitive. I'm sure you've, you know, gone over in like your physics classes and, and whatever else, but stress, the basic definition is a force applied over a given area. All right, so if we have our bar, and let's say that we are applying tension, which we're gonna do for our lab. So we have a force, an equal force on each end here, so we're in tension. You could call it P, you could call it F, call it whatever you want, um, we're in tension here. So if we're applying a force, then that force is gonna be distributed over our given cross-sectional area. So if we're looking at this top surface here in purple, we have that force P and it's being applied over that given cross-sectional area. So force applied over area. If you can ever read my writing, and it seems to get worse as the lecture goes on. Just tell me, you know, like, what the hell did you write there? I'll let you know. Okay, you can also think about stress as the intensity of the force. So what I mean by that is if we have, um, you know, a very small amount of force, then our stress isn't going to be that high. If we increase that force over a given area, then our stress is going to increase. So all of this I think is pretty intuitive from what you know from all of your other classes. Okay, the equation that we have for stress is sigma equals F over A. Sigma, that's gonna be stress. F, that's gonna be our force. A is gonna be our cross-sectional area. Okay, the units for this so we don't use SI units for any of the labs. Don't complain to me, that's just the, the standard. So for stress, that'll be PSI or you know pounds per inches squared. And of course, our force, that'll be pound force and area inches squared. So if we look at our equation here, what we're gonna be doing in the lab, is of course increasing our force and that's going to increase our stress and then at some point as we continue to increase that force and the stress is increasing there is going to be a localized area in our rod where the stress is really really high and because of that our rod is going to fail at that localized area so that's what you saw you know a few minutes ago when i i pointed out that 
and at some point in our rod, the cross-sectional area decreases quite a lot. So we're going to talk about that in more depth too, but that's where it's going to fail. There's a very high amount of stress there, so the rod's going to eventually fail. So in this picture here, I have a picture of the fracture surfaces that we're going to see in the lab. So on the left is a cup and cone fracture, and that's going to occur on more ductile material. So you'll see that for the aluminum specimen in our lab. And for the steel specimens that we have, it won't be as smooth as what you see here on the right hand side. Uh, they're not quite that brittle, but more brittle failures, you're, you're going to see that they're very smooth surfaces. Because they're not ductile at all, they can't really deform very much. So, you know, we have this cup and cone fracture for ductile materials because they're elongating, you know, quite a lot before they fracture. Okay, next thing is strain. Okay, strain, that's going to be a way for us to, to describe or quantify um, how much an object deforms. So, again, once we're in the lab and we're applying that stress uh, or that load, we're going to have stress. And um, as we keep applying that load, our rod is going to elongate. So it's going to get longer and longer. And the uh, cross-sectional area of the rod is going to initially kind of uniformly decrease because, you know, as we lengthen uh, from conservation of mass, we need to have our cross-sectional area decrease. So let's draw this out. Oh, wow, great rectangle there. Okay, so here's our rod in the beginning. And then once we apply our load, you're going to see that it gets longer, right? And it, it also gets thinner, so the cross-sectional area is decreasing, again, from conservation of mass. Of course, this isn't a, a fluids class, but same kind of principle there. So let's write out our definition. Strain is a way to describe an object's deformation. And by deformation, in this case, since we have a tensile test, I mean the change in length. And just like stress, we could also kind of think about that as the intensity of a force. We can think about strain as the intensity of deformation. So for our lab, uh, aluminum is going to have more strain, so it's going to be deforming more than the other steel specimens that we have. All right, and then the equation that we have for strain is gonna be epsilon. That strain is equal to delta L, our change in length, over the initial length. So very simple. And uh, because we have a change in length over the, ori the original length, that's going to be a unitless parameter. So even though it's unitless, you'll often see it um, shown as, you know, inch per inch or maybe millimeters per millimeter, depending on, you know, whatever units you're using. Even, even though it's unitless, we're still going to show the units that we had for that deformation and that original length. So for us, it's going to be inch per inch. Okay, so that's strain very simple stuff so far but now we're going to get to the important the most important part of this lecture which is the stress strain diagram so i know you guys said you, you just kind of touched on stress and strain so far in your class so i don't i don't know did, did you guys talk about the stress strain diagram yet that's more 
meaty than basic definitions. Yeah. Okay, cool. I don't think I s we went over it in my class. Okay, that's fine. We're going to go over um, a good amount here. All right, so this is, uh, you know, you could also kind of say this is the main part of this lab because uh, what we're doing is collecting load data and deformation data, and we're going to convert the load data to stress and the deformation data to strain, and we're going to make a plot from that, and that's going to be our stress-strain graph. And this graph is going to give us insights on material properties, which we can then use to compare these materials. And we can also use the graph to calculate things. So one of the things that we're going to calculate is the elastic modulus, and we're going to compare the results that we get to publish values. So I just had a lot of stuff, so let's write some of this down. So this stress strain diagram, we're going to obtain it. So obtained by converting load and deformation data to stress and strain. And again, this is going to give us insights on material properties. So if we only look at the load data and the deformation data, that's only giving us insight on that unique material that we tested. Uh, you know, because it'll be some length and some cross-sectional area. But if we remove that variable by, uh, you know, taking that or well, dividing that cross-sectional area out, we can get insights just on the material itself. So even if we had a test of, you know, two different materials, or the same material, but rather different geometric dimensions, so maybe this was material one in material, or uh, I should say specimen, sorry. So let's say that one and two here, they're the same material, but they're, again, different geometric dimensions. Um, Regardless of that, if we if we convert this to a stress drain diagram, you should see that they have uh, basically the same results. Of course, it's going to be a little different because there might be some, uh, you know, defects in that specific specimen. Um, but by and large, you should have a very similar stress drain diagram. Okay, so let's draw just an arbitrary stress drain curve. That's it, pretty boring. You, you can see a lot of different kind of curves depending on the material that you have. But on the y-axis, we have our stress, sigma. And on the x-axis, we have our strand, epsilon. Okay, so for now, I'm just gonna mark different kind of uh, points of interest, and we're going to go over all of these as we go on. So, the first one we're going to do right here. This region is going to be our elastic range. Okay, and then I'm kind of thinking about the best way I want to label all of these. Up here, this is going to be our yield point. Up top here, at our highest point, this is going to be our UTS, or ultimate tensile strength. And at the last point, we have, of course, fracture. You could probably guess that. And then we're also going to point out another region that we have. So in between our ultimate tensile strength and fracture, 
this region is going to be necking. Okay, so there we go. Those are the most, uh, you know, the most important points or, or uh, regions that we have on our stress strain curve. So I mentioned before that one of the things that we're going to do in this lab is calculate the elastic modulus. And we do that by looking in the elastic range, as you would guess from the name of elastic modulus. And we're going to look at the stress and strain in that region to calculate it. That's, um, that's what we're going to talk about, uh, I think now and also in, in a few slides. Okay, so first thing we're going to go over is the very first region, which is the elastic region. And of course, if you guys have any questions, you know, throughout this lecture, uh, feel free to ask. All right, I'm going to call that elasticity instead. So elasticity, the definition for that is going to be an abilities uh, or the ability for a material to return to its very exact original dimensions after we apply some load and then we take that load off. Okay, so for this, let's take a look at our stress strain diagram. So let's say that we, of course, we're going to be within this elastic range. So let's say that I apply the load up to here. So, you know, a certain amount of load is going to correspond to this amount of stress, and it's going to correspond to this amount of strain. If we were going to then take that load off, we could go all the way back to our origin here. We could recover all of that strain that we just underwent. So, you know, even though we deformed to this amount of strain here, we could recover all of that strain. We could basically recover all of that deformation that we just went under, went under and we could get back to our very original uh, dimensions. Meaning the very same length and the very same cross-sectional area. Okay, so a little note on elasticity. This, just again like the name implies, it's only going to be valid or it's only going to occur in our elastic range that we labeled in, in red in our graph. Okay, and then for here, um, we're, we're going to have a formula it's going to be sigma equals epsilon, or not epsilon, sigma equals capital E, which is our elastic modulus, multiplied by our strain epsilon. So uh, Hooke's law, right? And what you see here is that there's a linear relationship between stress and strain. And this relationship is only to be valid within that elastic range. So in our elastic range, our graph here is linear. Okay, and then after that, it's going to be nonlinear, and this equation for Hooke's law, it's no longer going to be valid because we are nonlinear after that. All right, so let's talk about the proportional limit and the elastic limit. Okay, the proportional limit uh, by definition. And this is going to be the point at which our linear rel relationship ends. So when our graph stops being linear. Okay, so I'm going to draw kind of a zoomed in view. 
of a stress strain curve, we're just looking at basically the elastic region. Actually, let's do it like this. Mm, let me make this a different color. Okay, there we go. So let's point out our proportional limit here. So again, the proportional limit, that's when, or that's the point when our linear relationship ends. So on our graph here, that's at the very end of our blue line. So that's gonna be right here. After this point, you can see that we start to curve a bit. So let's call this, um, I call it PL for proportional limit, okay? And so that's where our uh, linear relationship ends. But for some materials, and I want to say some materials, we can actually, or they can still behave elastically even when it's uh, no longer linear. So let's get, uh, yeah, I'll keep this. So we're going to go up here, and I'm going to call this EL for elastic limit. Okay, and just like we talked about up here uh, for our elastic range, the elastic limit, that's going to be basically the end of our elastic range. So anything after that, uh, this equation here, Hooke's Law, is no longer applicable. So I know this can seem like, I don't know, at least at first a little confusing, almost contradictory to what I said earlier. But remember that this is only for some materials where they can still behave elastically even after this linear relationship where we go up to the proportional limit. So this entire range here, this is our elastic range. Okay, so the elastic limit, this is going to be the point when our elastic range ends. And in red here, I'm going to say that for most materials, the proportional limit and the elastic limit, they're going to be the same. Or virtually, you know, it's going to be so negligible, the difference between the two, it's going to look exactly the same on your stress strain curve. Okay, so there's only, you know, some funky kind of materials where even though our curve, our stress strain curve is no longer linear, it's still behaving elastically up to a point, which is the elastic limit. And then anything after that elastic limit, so let's say an orange here, this is going to be plastic deformation, meaning that it's permanent deformation. Okay, also like rubber, um, so I don't know, was that, what was that in reference to you? The plastic deformation? Okay, so PL equals EL. I mean, it, it depends on the material. So just remember that most materials, and I think it's like that for our lab, they're going to be the same. I don't know about rubber specifically. Okay, let's see, anything else? So remember that in our elastic range, that's when we have Hooke's Law, that's when it's valid. Anything outside of that elastic range, it's, it's not valid. And we're gonna be using Hooke's Law to, uh, to calculate our elastic modulus. And we'll talk about you know that actual calculation in a bit, even though 
just looking at what we did here, I mean, it's it's pretty obvious. So remember that Hooke's law is going to be sigma equals elastic modulus times strain. We can solve for that. E equals sigma over epsilon. That's just rise over run. Okay, next thing is the yield point. Alright, so our yield point is going to be the point when we have a very small increase in stress, basically a negligible increase in stress, and as a result we're going to have a very large increase in strain. Okay, so for this, and it's um, it can be also separate from the elastic limit. So uh, remember that this is just a, a point, right? It's it's the point when there's a large increase in strain for some very small increase in stress. So depending on the material, this yield point is going to look vastly different. So for a very brittle material, there's going to be a very, um, or let's let's not say a very brittle material, but a more brittle material, there's going to be a defined yield point. For really ductile materials, that yield point is going to be hard to, to pinpoint down. So let's draw a stress strain curve again. Okay, so here, you know, this is very exaggerated, right? But we see as we increase our stress at some point, Right here, there's there's no increase um, in stress. In this case, it actually goes down a little bit. But the point is, is that there's very little increase in stress or none, and there's a very large increase in strain, you know, as we go there. So this point in red, this is going to be our yield point. <clears throat> and so for this arbitrary material that I just drew, you know, for a stress strain curve. It was very defined, but like I just mentioned, for some materials, this yield point is going to be really hard to, to pinpoint. So if we have a ductile material, and our stress strain curve is something like this, it's really hard to, to pinpoint where that yield point is, because it's a very gradual transition from being in our linear range to our uh, plastic range. So, you know, when this is the case, you know, we don't really see any any very obvious point when there's a, a very little or no increase in stress to a very large increase in strain. It's very gradual. So when that occurs, we need to uh, instead to find something called the yield strength. And that's going to be a, uh, dependent on how much strain we have for that material. So this is going to be for materials that don't have a well-defined yield point. We're going to say calculate the yield strength. Maybe calculation isn't a great word. It's not really a calculation. Um, so for this, uh, again, it's dependent on how much strain we have. So it's defined by uh, the official terminology is a specific amount of permanent set. So what they mean by that is permanent or plastic deformation, meaning um, 
you know, how much we've deformed and we're going to convert that deformation to strain. And from that, we can find our yield strength. So specific amount of permanent set. So at least in the book that I have used, which is um, Phil Pot is the author. I think you guys use a different book now. Um, anyway, so definitions, they might vary a bit. I'm not, I'm not sure, but in the book that I've used for years, one of the kind of rules of, of thumb here for yield strength is a permanent set of 0.05%, I believe, and 0.2%. So we're going to be using 0.2% for our lab. So that's 0.2% of permanent set. And, you know, this is really just 0.002 inch per inch of strain. So if we're looking at our stress strain curve, and, you know, we don't have a well-defined yield point, we're going to define a yield strength. So all we have to do to find this yield strength is look when we have epsilon or a strain of 0 0.002 inch per inch. And what we're going to do is draw a line that's uh, parallel to our elastic region. Okay, so, you know, I, I did the best I could, okay? So, that line in green, it's supposed to be parallel to the elastic region of our stress strain curve. So, when we have a, a, a linear relationship. And from here, um, we are going to look at this in intersection point to our stress strain curve. So, that's right there. And we're going to go over to our stress and that is going to define our yield strength so I'm going to call that sigma ys for uh, yield strength okay any questions on this for uh, how to find it or anything that we've gone over okay and then remember to um, we're going to go over uh, a good amount of this, probably all of this uh, data reduction for this lab as a class. So I'll actually show you in MATLAB how we're going to kind of uh, mm, automate it, I guess. We're not going to be doing any eyeballing. We're actually going to have MATLAB explicitly tell us where our intersection point is, and that'll give us the exact yield strength that we have for, for a given material. All right, the next thing is the ultimate tensile strength, which is, you know, probably the most easiest, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, point of interest on the stress strain curve. So I'm just going to go back up, basically. Don't even really need to, uh, to draw anything new. Let's actually take a look at our picture from the slides. So the ultimate tensile strength is going to be the point uh, it's going to be the highest point of stress that a material can handle. So we're going to look at the at the highest peak of our stress strain curve for each material, and that's going to be our ultimate tensile strength. So very simple definition there. All right, next thing is going to be necking. So we've mentioned the necking a few times throughout. Okay, and basically, as a little intro, remember that as we increase our tensile load, our rod is going to increase in length, and because we're increasing it in length by conservation of mass, our cross-sectional area is going to decrease throughout the rod. So we already drew a picture before. Let's do it again. Okay, now I'm going to really exaggerate it.
So in one, that's before tension, and two, we're gonna say that this is during tension. So we'll say as load increases, the rod is going to elongate. Okay, so as you can see from my, my great uh, rendition here, the cross-sectional area is kind of uniformly decreasing throughout the rod. But uh, from one of the pictures that you saw earlier in VKS, you saw that there was a localized region where the cross-sectional area decreased more than the, than the rest of the rod. And that's the area where we have necking. Let's move this down a bit. Okay, and excuse the, the shittiness of the drawings, okay? But in this region here, this is necking. So this will be region three as we continue to apply that tension. I guess really this, is, this should be longer than number two here. Let me just do it like this. Okay, and it's, it should also be thinner, but y you guys get it, okay? And we'll see that this is more tension. And because we have this very uh, localized area of this reduced cross-sectional area, our stress is going to increase. In that region, we're going to have this stress concentration. You'll talk about that. I think there's a whole chapter on stress concentrations for your solid mechanics class. So let's say in necking region, we have a stress concentration so let's look at our formula for stress, sigma equals F over A, our area is decreasing our cross-sectional area in that region is decreasing. Because of that, our stress is going to increase. So as that stress increases and that uh, localized area, eventually it's gonna to be too much stress for the material and the material is going to fracture. Okay, now let's look at some of these pictures here. They're pretty good. Okay, so in the very first picture on the, on the far left, we have what, what I am assuming is before there's any tension that's applied to this material. Okay, so the entire rod here, or the section of the rod, it's very uniform in cross-sectional area. And you can also see that it's it's the widest point of, or it's the, the thickest of any of the other pictures. Okay, in picture two, um, the cross-sectional area is kind of uniformly decreasing. And our rod is, again, from conservation of mass, it's elongating a bit. Oh, uh, screw you. Okay, I was going to try to draw on this too. Oh, well. But you see in the second picture, there's you can actually kind of already see that it's kind of starting to taper a bit. And so our necking region is already taking place. Okay, in picture three, you can see the necking is far more defined. There is a, a very localized region where the cross-sectional area is decreasing compared to the rest of the rod. And then in picture four, it, it's hard to tell, but I think at that point it actually has fractured and they've put those two pieces kind of, they fit them back together. So in that area of necking, that's where we have a fracture. And you can see again that that cross-sectional area there is extremely small compared to the rest of the rod. All right, any questions on necking?
Okay. So last point on the stress strain curve is the fracture point and pretty obvious, you know, that's where, or that's going to be the stress at which failure is going to occur. You know, um, there's going to be a question and probably you're going to talk about this in the lecture. Uh, I, I know instructors, they like to have this as almost like a, maybe not a trick question, but a little thought provoking question, which is why does the why is the stress at the fracture point, why is that less than the stress at our UTS? Now, why are we breaking at a lower stress than we already encountered? We should be breaking at a higher stress, right? Because like I've been saying this whole time, at a certain point, we're increasing the stress. And at some point, our material can't handle that stress anymore. And it fractures. So if your instructor hasn't brought this up yet, I guess you guys can answer this in class. We're about to explain why this happens. Okay, so the reason for this, uh, let's also draw this out. So here we have our UTS, and there's our fracture point. So you can see the UTS is higher than the fracture point uh, for the stress. And the reason for this is that we've been, um, in, in our equation, when we are calculating stress, kind of baked in into that equation, we've been assuming that the cross-sectional area has been constant when we know in reality that the cross-sectional area is not constant. You know, it's been changing this whole time. It's been decreasing throughout the rod and particularly in the necking region, you know, it's localized. It's even, uh, it's been decreasing at a faster rate than the rest of the rod. So our equation here for stress, it's assuming that the cross-sectional area is constant. Okay, one that's, um, you know, not true in reality. So, you know, what we should see for our stress strain curve is instead something like this. Okay, so in reality, we're actually seeing a curve like we've seen red there. So. Uh, and this is what is called the true stress. So you see that our black curve and red curve, they're, they're very similar from our elastic region and some of our yielding region. But once we get around to the UTS, they start to separate. So we know in reality that we are increasing our stress and that's what you see in red. But remember baked in um, from the equation that we've been using to calculate stress for the stress strain curve, we've uh, been assuming that the cross-sectional area is constant. We know that's not true, but that's how we calculate our stress strain curve. And so this black curve is called engineering stress. Okay, now of course there's going to be the question of, well, why don't we, you know, uh, take that into account, take that changing cross-sectional area in, into account. And the answer for that is, is that it's hard to continuously measure that changing cross-sectional area throughout, throughout our test. Uh, I think there are some machines that actually do measure this throughout the uh, tensile test, but, um, you know, they're, they're not that common, at least for universities, right? And, uh, I'm sure they're very expensive. So 
you know, for us, we can just do what we've been doing, um, which is using true stress, or sorry, engineering stress. And this is what you'll see pretty much everywhere too. So the kind of standard is using engineering stress, even though that we know in reality that the area is not constant when we are doing a tension test. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind, um, just to, to have it, you know, for your knowledge. Okay, the next thing, we're getting towards the end, so don't worry, is the elastic modulus. So I've talked about this a few times now, uh, and I've mentioned that we're going to calculate the elastic modulus from our stress strain curve, and we're going to compare that to published values. So before we talk about how we're going to calculate it, um, let's just remember that the elastic modulus, capital E, that's a way that we can characterize a material's behavior in the elastic range. So the elastic modulus is uh, how stiff a material is, and it gives us a way to predict, and I want to emphasize that predict, how a material is going to uh, respond to a given load. So how much is it going to stretch? Um, you know, basically how much is it going to deform or how much strain can it undergo? But it's a prediction. It's not a, a fast and hard rule. It's a prediction. a measure of material stiffness and let's say way to predict its response to a load. So uh, let's also say, let's look back at our equation here, Hooke's Law. Nope. Ah. Not sigma equals E times sigma. Sigma equals elastic modulus multiplied by strain. So um, as I mentioned, we want to calculate the elastic modulus. So we're going to rearrange this to Elastic modulus equals our stress over our strain. And I'm going to add on some deltas in front. So for this, we're going to be looking at our stress strain curve. And we're going to be looking, remember, at the elastic range, because Hooke's Law is only valid in the elastic range. And we're going to look at our change in stress over our change in strain. That's, of course, rise over run. We're calculating the slope and that elastic range, and this is gonna give us the elastic modulus. Okay, so pretend that's a, a straight line. So what we're doing here is looking at point two, point one, those are kind of arbitrary points. Um, and then we're gonna be doing E, equals sigma two minus sigma one over epsilon two minus epsilon one. Okay, and that's how we're gonna calculate the elastic modulus. So we're, we're using a range here, a delta, so we can avoid the effect of noise. And also I would recommend that when you're doing this, you don't go uh, at the origin or at the point where we start to yield. You know, you wanna make sure that you're in a range here where it's linear, so you can actually have the most accurate calculation that you can have for the elastic modulus. And um, you don't want to go close to the origin because even though we're applying a preload and this should take out the effect of slack, uh, you know, there might be a little bit of slack in the very beginning. So we want to make sure that we don't uh, kind of incorporate that noise into our calculation here. 
All right, so that's how we calculate the elastic modulus. And again, we're going to be comparing our calculation to published values. And then we're going to take a look at that percent error. And in your lab memo, you're going to discuss, you know, why you had that error and what were some possible sources of error. Okay, the last thing we're talking about today is ductility. So to simply define ductility, this is going to be a material's capacity for plastic deformation. So how much can a material deform? How much strain can it uh, undergo before it fractures? Okay, so a ductile material, it's going to be able to undergo quite a lot of strain before fracture. So, you know, uh, think about silly putty or, or gum, something like that. If we apply a tensile force to it, you know, we're stretching it apart. It's going to stretch a lot. So it can undergo quite a lot of plastic deformation. It's plastic deformation, right? Because as we stretch this um, at a certain point really fast for something like gum, of course, it's not going to be able to return to its original geometric dimensions. So it can undergo quite a lot of plastic deformation, permanent deformation, before it breaks in half. Compare that to something that's brittle. So it's hard to think of a, a good like real life example for like a tension test for a brittle material. Um, but just for sake of simplicity, just think about glass, you know, even though it's not, and for this example, in tension, glass is really brittle. It's going to break easily. It's not going to be able to undergo uh, a lot of deformation at all. It's just going to be able to take a certain amount of load, and at some point, it's just going to break. It's not going to be able to deform much at all. Um, so that's going to be a brittle material. So ductile, accept a lot of strain. And then a brittle material, we cannot accept a lot of strain before fracture. And Tom getting very lazy towards the end here. Okay. All right, so those are our, our two differences. So let's take a look. Now I have peanut brittle. Now I want some peanut brittle. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So if we look at our picture here. Uh, you know, you can see this brittle material and this ductile material. So the ductile material, it's able to uh, accept quite a lot of strain. It can deform quite a lot before it fractures. And the brittle material, you can see that um, in this case, you know, it is deforming a bit. It is accepting some strain. You can, you can see some plastic deformation because we're going from linear to nonlinear in our curve. But there's not very much. It can't deform that much before it breaks. If you also look at this graph, you can see that ductility is not necessarily related to strength. So again, there's not this hard and fast rule where there's this 100% um, of the time correlation from ductility and strength. So again, looking at this picture, both the ductile material and the brittle material, they both have the same UTS. So they have the same strength here, even though the ductility is, is very different. But with that said, in general, 
um, there is a relationship or correlation with uh, ductility and strength. So that's uh, this slide here. You can see here that all of these, they have different amounts of ductility so um, and strength. So the, the very first material, it's really not ductile at all, meaning there's very little strain. In fact, uh, material one, it looks like it's not really deforming at all. There's really no plastic deformation. It's a, a linear line and then it fails. So that's a very brittle material. Material two, there's a little bit of deformation before it breaks. Three, you know, there's, there's a good amount of deformation. And then four, there's quite a lot of deformation. But the point of this slide is that in general, yeah, there, there is a correlation from ductility and material strength. Meaning as we get stronger, the ductility in general is going to decrease. All right, now we're, now we're on the, the last thing which is how we're going to quantify ductility. So there's two different ways. One way is what we've just been talking about. That's looking at the strain at fracture. Okay, so basically what we were just going over in that slide. And another way to quantify ductility is looking at the percent reduction in a cross-sectional area. So back when we were <clears throat> looking at VKS, remember I said in the beginning of the lab, you're going to measure the original cross-sectional area while well, you're measuring the diameter then you're going to calculate that cross-sectional area and also at the end after we fracture the material remember we're going to get those two pieces kind of fit them together and we're going to measure that uh, diameter at the fracture surface to get the cross-sectional area at the fracture surface and we're going to use both of those to then calculate um, the percentage in our in our uh, or the percent reduction of our cross-sectional area uh, kind of a mouthful so let's write this down now so we have the percent reduction in area And this again is a way to quantify ductility. And to do this, we're going to look at the differences in our cross sectional area. So the formula for this, okay, I'm giving a little acronym here for a percent reduction in area. I'm going to call that PRA. So PRA is equal to A naught minus A sub F all over A naught multiplied by 100 so we can get a percentage. That F, that's a subscript. So remember, A naught, that's the original cross-sectional area. Okay, and then A sub F, that's going to be our cross-sectional area at the fracture surface. All right, so it's, it's a pretty easy calculation and we're gonna be taking a look at that and we're gonna be comparing the percent reduction in cross-sectional area between the two, or the, sorry, the three materials that we're gonna be testing. So that's 6061 T6 aluminum, 1018 steel and 1045 steel. Okay, any questions on any of these slides from today? Okay, I'm gonna share my desktop screen again. I'll be uploading this recording if you wanna 
get any of the, the notes that I wrote down and didn't have time or something. Okay, so uh, let's see, any more announcements? You guys can take a look at VKS again, you know, before our lab next week. Be sure that you show up on campus because the lab is in person. Make sure you bring a mask too because we got to wear masks uh, inside. And I haven't been on campus yet still. So, you know, I imagine they have masks available if you forget yours, but just, you know, bring your mask. And also, I'm going to upload the, the kind of updated procedures from Dr. Sue, and I'll send you guys an email when I when I put that on Canvas. So it's basically going to look the same as these VKS procedures. The only difference is the software uh, is going to be different. So the pictures where it shows software, that's going to be different. Remember to bring safety glasses as well next week. And make sure that you're wearing shoes. So closed toe shoes. Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. The safety glasses, do they have to be just like how you, uh, in the slideshow? Like, you know how they're the big bulky ones? They no, they, they, they don't need to be gigantic like, like that. They don't have to be those specifically, just any sort of like protection? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so they can be, you know, if you go on Amazon and you look up safety glasses, just any of those, or they can be these big goggles if you want those too. Doesn't matter. All right, any other questions? Okay, if not, that's all I have for this week. So enjoy your weekend. Make sure you show up next week in person in E42. That's where we're going to meet first, okay? So Thanks. that's all I got. See you guys. Have a good weekend. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Hey, it's a long one this time. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's probably the longest one. Maybe. Oh, wait, you said longest lecture or lab? No, no, no. I was talking about longest weekend. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, weekend. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I'm just thinking about the lecture, but yeah. A long is weekend. This, I'm looking forward to that. The longest one, though. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. Um. Well, I'll, I'll actually say this: next week is going to be our shortest one for sure. Our next lab or next lecture, I mean. I gotta ask. Um, isn't I think E42 is over by the machine shop, right? It's like. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. close to it. It's kind of like if you're if you're facing the machine shop, the door for that. Then E42 is to the right of it. So there's there's like a, a hallway or I don't want to say hallway, but it, there's the, there's a separation between the buildings. So you could go to the gastronome. So E42 is to the right of the machine shop. Okay, I just figured I'd double check. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else have any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, then I'm going to end it, and I'll see you guys next week, all right? See you next week. Have a good Labor Day. You too. See you. Thank you. See you.